Right, today is page 26. Today we're going to study a very special sutta from SD 3.2 brackets 5.2. Now if you see a brackets, that means it is an embedded sutta. Embedded, buried inside the chapter. So it is an, an extra important sutta. It's called the uh, Vimutta Yatana Sutta. Vimutta Yatana, there's an apostrophe, so one vowel is missing. So Vimutti. Vimutti plus Ayatana. Eh? Vimutti means freedom, liberation. Ayatana here means base, ground, okay, support. Sutta means thread. The discourse on the grounds for freedom. Vimutti, freedom also means awakening. So here Vimutti has a wide range of meanings. Eh? It can be temporary freedom. You feel peaceful. It can be permanent freedom by way of awakening. And this sutta is from A5.26. Okay, so you remember either the name of the sutta, Vimutta Yatana Sutta, which is very famous, or you remember A5.26. So, now this sutta tells us that we can feel happy, we can even gain some level of understanding and awakening by listening to the teachings. Eh? We're on page 26, 26, okay? Now you notice this is from A5.36, so there's a five, that means there are five qualities. Okay? Now, this early suttas, they're all recited. Eh? The people memorize them. So everything is kind of like repeated, like a song. Okay? But here, everything is translated, written down nicely. You know? So we have a bit of a problem here because previously everything was heard. People listen you know, and in a language they understand. Uh, it's not Pali. It is some kind of dialect in India. In India has got many dialects. You've got, you've got Magadi dialect, Kosala dialect and so on. You know? And then, uh, you know, Buddhism went as far as Afghanistan. You know? There, there, there's a place called Gandhari, so they got their own dialect there also. And over there, they write their, their writing is from right to left. Ne? And uh, we don't know how far the teaching spread, but I'm quite sure in Asoka's time, because of the great empire Asoka has built and this very big business going on, world trade, Wherever the traders go, Buddhism also went. In fact, some of the, the most important people who spread religion are the traders. The traders, uh, they want to feel safe. So they, they bring Buddha images, Buddha relics and so on. And they, they do some chanting. And you find you can discover some of these ancient inscriptions, ancient writing on some of the verses even in our area in Kedah and you can never know maybe in Singapore or Canning Hill if you dig widely enough ne? all these ancient uh, like mantras and some of them are in Pali some of them are in Sanskrit so it shows that uh, Buddhism is very widespread through the, by the traders and the traders go to all over Asia right they come as far as Southeast Asia to our island to Borneo to Indonesia, they went as far as Sri Lanka and then of course Southeast Asia, Myanmar and so on. And they went west, Afghanistan. Afghanistan was a very strong Buddhist country uh, uh, during those early centuries. Uh, Kashmir, you know? and then further west, even to Asia Minor. Maybe even to Greece, we don't know. Okay, there's one modern scholar, uh, he used the word ancient Greek Buddhism 
<laughs> so he has this idea that you know, even the Greeks also know some Buddhism, but, but scholars are not very sure about this. But uh, it wouldn't be surprising, the you know, Greeks are being so intelligent, such a culture of great intelligence and philosophy, you obviously know some Buddhism. Eh? And there are some philosophers there who follow the practices very much like the Buddha's teaching. They are called the Stoics. They practice very strict, simple life. You know? We call it Stoic. That means very uh, simple in lifestyle. And then there was Alexander the Great, this young man in his 20s conquering half of Southern Asia, the so whole swath of Southern Asia from Macedonia, across Arabia, across right down to Persia, Afghanistan, right to the borders of India. He almost crossed over the Bayas River and conquered India. If he did that today, we would be speaking Greek, you know. But even then, he, he was treated like a god, you know. Such a young, powerful, good-looking, kind uh, ruler. In, in fact, wherever he went, he, he was very diplomatic with local people. He, mar he married local people also. And, and he named many of his cities, Alexandria, I don't know, nearly 20 of them, all over the place, you know. So he was such a powerful figure that I think he also influenced Buddhism, you know. There is one teaching in Buddhism called the Great Man, Mahapurisa. Although the suttas and the commentaries say that this, uh, or they call the qualities, 32 qualities of the Great Man is found in the in the Sanskrit text, no scholars have found that. You, you cannot find those teachings in the those Sanskrit texts. So the question now is, where did this idea of this great man, Mahapurisa, come from? Because they, they, the suttas see the Buddha as a great man. Remember, that there is the story of, of uh, uh, the Buddha, the Bodhisattva, the Buddha before his awakening, that if he stayed hope, he will become a world monarch, just like Alexander the Great, because he's a great man, Mahapurisa. But if he remain home, uh, if he left home rather, renounce the world, he become a world teacher, world ruler, world teacher. So the Buddha was like that. So already there is this idea among the early Buddhists. So they see the, I mean, you can imagine this very powerful person coming all the way to, to your next door, you know, right? So. The, the Buddhists use this idea of Mahapurisa also, the 32 marks. And if you study the 32 marks, you find that Alexander has some of these marks. One, one just interesting thing about Alexander is that uh, his eyes are of two different colors, <laughs> things like that, you know. And uh, when he stands, his stand was called contrapposto, that is Italian meaning you stand like, you know, like teenagers like to stand, you know, they're kind of like a little bit bent. That's not because he's being stylish. There are records that say actually he has some bit of spine problem. You know, so these are all very interesting facts we're discovering now. So I've done some research on these 32 marks in some detail, telling you what's going on. They are not actually marks of a great man, really. Actually, many of those marks show the person has got some physical, medical problem, actually. So that's why you don't really see the Buddha with all the 32 marks. For example, one of the 32 marks is the hands are very long. You can, while standing up, the hands can touch the knees. Now you will see a picture of Amitabha like that, <laughs> very long arms. But you will never see any human beings with that kind of long arms, because it's just not practical. Okay? So, some of these are just, just symbolic, they're meant to be symbolic. But remember, a lot of things in Buddhism are symbolic. In other words, they represent an idea. What does long arms mean? What does many hands mean? You know, you have all this story about Buddhism talk about many hands. It means compassion. When you need help, you say, can we have some hands here? Eh? Right? So there you are. So remember, many of these stories in Buddhism, they are symbolic. Right? 
for example, one day, you know, the scientists tell us, say, oh, it's, you say the gods are up there. I, I try in a spaceship all around the outer space. There's no gods, you know. So how? Are we going to say Buddhism is false? No, it is symbolic. Right? So we say the gods are symbolic beings. They represent people who are good, very born there, but we really don't know. In the case of the gods, we don't know. They could be aliens, you know, right? So we, talk, we, we have Buddha, what are we talking about? Aliens, because the aliens came to see him, for example, the gods, you know. So if you read the story today, you find all this story about gods coming to see the Buddha, nothing strange. I mean, if you can watch all Star Trek and Star Wars, all those aliens are there, why can't you listen to the story of the Buddha, right? That story was told 2,500 years ago. The Buddha was way ahead of his time, right? So there are a lot of these things in Buddhism we still don't know exactly what the Buddha is talking about. But when it comes to meditation, when it comes to precepts, we are very clear. So those extra things are not really important. I suspect the Buddha is very clever, very wise. No, I don't suspect. I, mean, I, I believe the Buddha is totally very wise. So he's telling all these stories for the future generations, you know. So a hundred years, five hundred years from now, when they look at the stars again, they say, hey, look, the Buddha knew all these things. And then by that time, we are already having colonies on, on the moon and some distant quadrant of the universe even. You know? So this is a very futuristic religion. Okay? So remember, symbolism is very important in Buddhism. We must not take what we cannot experience directly. We cannot take it literally. No? Then it will be very difficult. Okay? Take it as the Buddha says, if you cannot understand it, if it is uh, nothing to do with the Dharma, it is symbolic. You must draw out the meaning. Okay? Other teachings are very direct. For example, five precepts. Five... Uh, Aggregates, right? Consciousness, all these are direct. That way, that way we can be sure. Other things, they are not real like you and I are real. If you say the, the Buddhist sattvas are real like you and I, wow, very scary, you know? You know one, one teacher has a habit of saying that. I say, if you say that one day the thousand time Buddhist sattva appears in Orchard Road, how will people feel? Imagine a thousand arm being suddenly appear. People will panic, you know, right? We get, we, because we only know it's an image, a compassion. But it appears like that, wow, it's going to be scary. It's not human. These are symbolism of compassion. Of In the hand, there is an eye of wisdom. So it's all symbolic. The artist's way of presenting it. You must remember that, okay? They are not real like you and I are real. Because some of these teachers, they simply say things and then they don't realize that scholars out there watching and laughing, say, oh, this person doesn't study philosophy, you know? If you say real like human beings, wow, <laughs> that means they will die, you know? Right? If you say as real as you and I are real, so the Buddhist sotos will die. That means they're not permanent and so on, right? So there are a lot of problems when we teach religion. You must be very careful. So that's why I choose early Buddhism as the safest way to teach because it's about human experience about how we through our own effort can attain the very same state that the Buddha has attained because freedom is the same freedom Vimutti is the same Vimutti okay? this word Vimutti uh, is the name of a very famous book called Vimutti Magga uh, written by supposed to be by, written by an Arahat you know uh, it, it's not a very thick book, it's a very short, very clear summary of the Buddha's teaching. It is said that Buddha Gosha had this book, he used the book, that he copied it and then he wrote his own Visuddhi Magga. Because the Vimuti Magga belonged to another school, okay, called Abhayagiri. Uh, then there's the other big temple, the big monastery called Mahavihara in Sri Lanka. There was a big rivalry going on, different kings were supporting different temples. So this Mahavihara, uh, Buddha Gosha is kind of, he, he goes to Mahavihara because he wants the suttas and so on. So he has to write a thesis to present to the monks there to show that he is qualified enough to, you know, recite the Pali suttas and so on. So he wrote the Visuddhi Magga. Okay? So that's uh, Visuddhi, Vimutti, the kind of refer to the same thing. So today we're going to look at five aspects of this 
uh, very important term. Okay, look at page 26 to 6, near the bottom. Okay, the Buddha starts teaching section 1. The Buddha says, Bhikshus. Bhikshu means monk, okay, monks. Nah? Bhikshus, Pali is bhikkhu, Sanskrit is bhikshu. From the Sanskrit, you get the English word bhikshu. Right? So I use the English size word. Bhikshus, there are these five grounds for freedom where the unfreed mind of a monk dwelling heedful and exertive finds freedom where the mental influxes not wholly destroyed become wholly destroyed where the unattained unsurpassed safety from the yoke is attained okay the last phrase unattained unsurpassed safety from the yoke refers to nirvana yoke means something like something that binds you okay you're free so, okay, now you see the word monk, it says the mind of a monk, right? Here the Buddha addressing the monk. Here monk means meditator. Anyone who is meditating at that time, you are a monk. When you are meditating, your mind is peaceful. That's the real monk, okay? The state of a monk. It actually, technically, it's called bhikkhu bhava. Bhikkhu bhava, monkness. Ne? So you don't have to leave home to become a monk when you meditate. At that time, you are a monk. You, you are a renunciant. Okay? You let go of all the things that are troubling you, all the distractions. Right? So here, four are mentioned. This, they are called mental influxes. Yeah? So you can see note 35 there. There's a lot of things down there. You just need to remember the four things. Yeah? The four in, they're called influxes, influx or inflows. Because they flow through our senses, eye, ear, nose, tongue, trunk, body, and mind, and they distract us. Okay, thoughts in the mind. Okay, so, uh, so they're called influxes. The first one is called existence, right? Can you see? Sense desire. Uh, sorry, sense desire. First one, karma sava. Mm -hmm. Sense desire means whatever the senses that you experience, you want more and more of it. That's going to distract you. Number two is existence. You want to become this, become that, and then after this, say, oh, I won't be reborn in this place, that place. Then that's the second thing that will keep you inside samsara. It keeps you in suffering and keep you reborn again and again. Number three are views. Views, we have all kinds of ideas which we don't really know about, right? So I, views prevent us from seeing beyond uh, what we know eh? limits our knowledge views then number four is ignorance okay we don't understand the four noble truths so all that causes suffering right so all this will be overcome if you meditate properly so the buddha is saying you can get enlightened that's the ultimate possibility if not at least you get temporary freedom uh, Samaya Vimuti. So if you meditate properly, you relax, you calm yourself, you feel so peaceful. Right? So it's something like temporary nirvana. Yeah? There's one sutta which actually says something like that. It says when you sit peacefully and meditate, you're free from anger. That is a temporary nirvana. That's what it's like when your anger is gone. So you can imagine the Buddha and the Arahats, their nirvana is permanent, no more anger. So it must be very joyful. So it's something you can be you can experience. And the Buddha didn't use big, big names, you know. That don't mean anything. Sometimes you see some teachers that use big words, long, long words, you know. But the one scholar said that's just a statement. It's not a state. A statement is not a state. Why do people have long, long, big titles? Uh, like uh, Mahabrabha is the most funny man. I can't remember, it started very long. The, the great creator, the self-born one, the, the highly honored, almighty, and so on and so forth. You know. So you spend like you know, 20 seconds just telling his name. You know. So this, this monk was asking a question that every time he has to mention this title. So <laughs> it's like being a datto, you know. They have all these long, long names. <laughs> So the, the longer name you have means the less power you have. So you need a long name to show you have all that power. Yeah? So 
Well, see, in early Buddhism, you find all these teachings are very simple. The words are very simple. I, I have this old friend, you know. It's a privilege to know him all these years when he was still a university student. We wrote to each other because of his interest in Pali. That was at least 10 years ago, you know. Wow, now he's graduated and he's become a philologist. He's, he knows so many languages, you know. From the way he writes, he used Pali, Sanskrit, Tibetan, Chinese, plus a few other languages. Amazing, you know. He, he, has, come to, he has graduated to that level. And his main approach, many of these famous scholars, I, I know he's going to be very famous one day, it is the new generation, you know, they're called philologists, they study the language the Buddha used. I was quite happily surprised because uh, lately I've been talking about, I said, you know, the way I study all these suttas, you can never find technical terms, really fixed words in, in Pali. The Buddha will use certain words in certain contexts and you must always ask yourself, what is the context? What is the Buddha talking about here? The word Sankara, for example, has different meanings in different contexts, but we can know the meaning, that's the wonderful thing. No? Sankara can mean formation, uh, it can mean karma in the travelings, right? body, speech and mind. Right? Sankara can, means uh, all the things you create in your mind in, in the five aggregates, for example. Right? So in other words, the Buddha is using different terms to explain different things, but we know what it's about. It's not like he's freely using words with no meaning. There are meanings there. You know the context. So this uh, new scholar, he, he, his approach is that he's saying that after studying all the Pali words, he will analyze one word, you know, in great detail. Where this word is used in the suttas, and how it is used in Gandhari, in Afghanistan, how it is used in Sanskrit, how is it used in Chinese, and this is what you get, you know. So I said, wow, this is good, you know. So next time I can always say, oh, just read his work, you know. And you know, that's the, the way the Buddha taught, right. So there are no technical terms. The Buddha doesn't make big statements. The Buddha teaches you the state of the art, the experience. He talks about his experience, right. You find, especially in Mahayana, lots of big, big names of jhanas, you know, right. But then, they don't exist. They are just big names, that's all. Scholars have researched that. You know, one scholar, in fact, wrote a special, a special book about them. He titled his paper as The Statement is Not the State. Right, so, that's why we, nowadays we know a lot about Buddhism. You know, so, uh, it's easier to know the right thing, go straight to the heart of Buddhism. Not all these extra things what other people are talking about, other people invented, and so on. Buddhism is big business, you know, religion is big business nowadays. Psychology is making tons of money out of Buddhism. So that's why people invent all these stories and ideas for worldly gains. So don't get caught in this trap, right? Go for the real thing. Go for the real medicine. Yeah? Buddhism is like medicine. Okay, the form of the truth. Alright, so Buddha says if you... In these five kind of experiences, you can gain Peace of mind, freedom of mind. All right. The first one, that is section 2, you can see brackets 1. Here, because the teacher or a certain colleague of, uh, in the holy life, a certain fellow brahmachari, if you like, eh, in the role of a teacher, teaches the Dharma to a monk. All right. So basically, the sentence here means someone teaches the Dharma. This can be a teacher or someone who is playing the role of a teacher. That means temporary teacher. So this teacher is teaching. 2.2 Big shoes. As the monk listens to the Dharma taught by the teacher or the colleague in the holy life, that means another monk, in the role of a teacher, he knows and he knows the Dharma. In other words, he understands the spirit of the Dharma and the letter of the Dharma. Knowing the Dharma and knowing the goal, 
gladness arises in him. That's the first thing, you feel joyful, all right? Number two, because of gladness, zest arises. Now, I will read through this and I will explain. Because of zest, the body becomes tranquil. When the body is tranquil, tranquil means peaceful, he feels happy. A happy mind becomes concentrated. Okay? Now you have the Pali words there, the five Pali words. Pamuja, Piti, Asad, Asada, Sukha, Samadha. The last word is Samadhyati, meaning to be concentrated. Now, these five teachings, they don't seem to have a name. They're very, they're very close to the factors of awakening. But notice here. Now, in your meditation, you always told, smile, 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 right? You'll be wondering, where did Pia get the idea from? Eh? Okay, here it is. This is the one. Okay, so people ask you, who taught you to smile? Don't say we are, we are done, okay? Say it's the Buddha, okay? Look at Vimutta Yatana Sutta, section 2.3, okay? So if you're happy, then you can meditate well. So here there are certain conditions. Eh? You must focus. You meditate, you are focused. In this case, you listen to the Dharma, you pay full attention. And you understand the meaning and the purpose of the teaching. Of course, you can't get this at once. That is why we need to listen again and again. You come here once, uh, what, twice a month, roughly, right? So we keep hearing the same thing. And one day we say, oh, I got it. Right, you all know, I've been telling you, I've been studying Buddhism for over 50 years. Only now, you know, so I'm discovering some very fine points. Even today, you know. You know, I said, oh no, I got class, I got to come for class, I got to stop doing my writing, you know. It's a big sacrifice, a big renunciation, I got to drag myself away from my desk. And I said, I come here, I teach Dharma, then I go back, I'll continue, all right. Something beautiful, you know, I'm writing about. And I'm writing about the same thing, for the word truth, how people become stream winners, you know. But I'm putting all the teachings together in a, in a flow of ideas. Because it's very clear now. So this is what I'm doing my last few years of my life. Putting everything nicely so people will feel happy when they read it. And when they're happy, they will practice. You know that some people in my Facebook, they really have serious problems, all kinds of funny problems. So occasionally I will write some very powerful reflections. Powerful meaning very direct. If they read it, they know it's about them. But they are not alone, there are other people also. So it's not a personal thing. Then they feel, in fact, they give me feedback. They, after that, they, they read it, they say, wow, you know, I feel so emotional about this. I almost cried, but in a happy way, okay? So what they're saying is they felt that they're not alone, that their problem is not a secret. They can change. You know, so, and I'm very happy to hear that. And I always say, remember, it's the Buddha who's doing all this for you. It's the Dharma that's helping you. So this joy is a very important healing factor. You want to practice Buddhism well, you need joy. You want to stay healthy, you need joy. You want to learn the Dharma, you need joy. You want to live happily with people, with family, with others, you need joy. To be a good Buddhist, you need joy. Remember, last lesson I told you, what's the one word you should have as a Buddhist? It's joy. Based on loving kindness, of course, right? Even you do breath meditation, it brings joy. So this is an example of the, where you get the support for what you are saying in this sutta. Eh? So here basically the Buddha is saying, if you, he listens to the Dharma, so you listen to Dharma mindfully, let go of other thoughts, the phone ring or so, you, do one, you switch off the phone, doesn't matter. And that's Mara distracting you. Switch off the phone for a while. Just listen, because the talk will end very fast, you know, you can always phone back your friend, you know. So make sure you don't miss the train of thoughts. That will change your life, you know. So here, you listen to the Dharma, full attention, this wisdom and joy. See, the Buddha tells you there are five stages. You feel glad. Glad is just a simple joy and because you feel glad, it grows 
it becomes zest. Zest a bit more exuberant, a bit more strong. Yeah? And when you have zest, the scopiti, then the body becomes peaceful. You can sit down, relax, all right, yeah? and because your body is tranquil and peaceful, you become sukha. Sukha means totally comfortable. Another word is happy, sukha. Yeah? And because of sukha, because you're happy, your mind becomes concentrated. Your mind settles down. You, you're just happy. You don't have to do anything. For example, you meet someone, your friends, and let's sit down, just smile. He doesn't do anything, just smile. What do you say? You say, oh, he's happy. Maybe you found a girlfriend, right? So very happy. You know? <laughs> Something like that, all right? All right? So there you are. This is how meditation arises through joy, all right? So I'm focusing on this first section so that you have a good idea about the sutta, the spirit of the sutta. Eh? Any question about this paragraph? I will just explain anything. You're not clear. Any words? So in meditation, you just, uh, I mean, uh, b before meditation, listening to the Dharma, you just listen, let it flow through your heart and mind. You feel, you feel glad. And then from there, step by step, you become focused, and that helps your meditation also. All right. In fact, the Buddha says, if you do this properly, any of this, just the first stage. This is the first ground for freedom. If you do this carefully, you listen to the Dharma carefully. You can even be enlightened. You can, you can be awakened. There are stories of monks who become arhats by listening to the Buddha. Is this is not easy, of course, because they have done a lot of practice in previous lives. So in this life. They just listen and then zap, they get it. All right? I, I'm fortunate in the sense that uh, those days when, when the monks give talks, usually, you know, I can at once catch what they're saying. Then I say, oh, yeah, I should have thought it that way. Then I go back, I make my notes. I make notes, I put it together. So next time I hear another monk say something, I say, oh, yeah, that's the missing part. It's like collecting uh, missing parts of the jigsaw puzzle. You know? Or you play cards, you know, you collect all those, <laughs> what do you call, Pokemon cards or whatever cards, you know, and then you get this complete set, something like that. Okay, then the next one, section three, which is number two. Furthermore, bhikshus, neither the teacher nor a certain colleague in the holy life, in the role of a teacher, teaches the Dharma to a monk. But he himself teaches the Dharma in detail to others when he has, uh, as he has heard it, as he has mastered it as in theory. Okay, so this time, you are teaching the Dharma. You are telling someone about the Dharma. Maybe not the way I'm doing it here, you know, it takes one hour, but you are, you are explaining. So you are explaining, you are very peaceful, very focused, right? This is the meaning. You teach the Dharma. Just now, was you listen, right? So when you teach the Dharma, the Buddha says 3.3, Bhikshus, as the monk that is you, teaches the Dharma in detail to others, as he has heard it, as he has mastered it in theory. He knows the goal, he knows the Dharma, that means you teach the Dharma according to what the Buddha taught, not according to what some other teacher told you or some other uh, somewhere you read. Huh? This is your own experience. Knowing the goal and uh, knowing the Dharma, gladness arises in, in you. Because of gladness, zest arises. Zest is joy. Because of zest or joy, the body becomes tranquil peaceful. When the body is tranquil, he feels happy. A happy mind becomes concentrated. Right? So this is how you teach the Dharma. Bring joy and peace to others. All right? So then the closing part is the same. Everything repeats itself. It says, this big shoe is the second ground for freedom where the unfreed mind of a monk or meditator dwelling uh, heedful and assertive finds freedom or where the mental influxes that means all our defilements not wholly destroyed not completely destroyed become wholly destroyed completely destroyed 
where the unattained, unsurpassed safety of the yoke is attained. In other words, you will in time attain nirvana. Okay, so this is the second uh, freedom. Eh? Your mind becomes free, even when you are teaching. When you're teaching, you feel happy. Sometimes when I teach the Dharma also, I say, oh yeah, this is clearer now, you know, that I remember it and I go back and make a note, right? Because you got to make a note, otherwise you may forget it. Okay, third way of freedom. That is section four. Furthermore, big shoes, neither the teacher nor a certain colleague, here teacher, capital T means the Buddha, eh? nor a certain colleague in the holy life in the role of a teacher teaches the Dharma to a monk, nor he himself teaches the Dharma in detail to others that he has heard it, as he has mastered it in theory. But, okay, you see all the letters which are italicized, crooked, I mean everything is repeated earlier. Now, if you forget about it, don't worry, it doesn't matter. But 4.3 is the important one. But he himself recites the Dharma in detail to others as he has heard it, as he has mastered it in theory. Okay, so this is a third way of learning. Now, in the Buddha's time, they have no books, so they have to recite whatever they have learned. Even the sutta, they have to recite, right? When I was living in a monastery in Thailand, I often hear these monks, they recite, so they don't forget it, you know. So whenever I'm not sure, our schooling is different. We don't use that kind of monastic memorizing. I, I can't remember so well. So I go to my friend in the next kuti and say, Hey, please recite for me this uh, sutta. And he will recite. Then I will listen carefully. I say, Okay, stop. That's the one. Okay. <laughs> I will write it down. So they are like uh, living tape recorders, you know. They, they can memorize chunks and chunks of Pali. So you recite. Of course, you can hear... In this case, you read the sutta, basically. You read the sutta either aloud or to yourself. So that's regarded as reciting the Dhamma. Or maybe you, you might recite, say, Metta Sutta in Pali. You know? Because you know it so well, you even you hear the Pali that you know the meaning. For example, if you look at the, you know, the nine virtues of the Buddha, the six virtues of the Dhamma, the nine virtues of the Sangha, you, you memorize them, then, you know, itipiso, bhagava. So as you hear the word, oh, the meaning flows in your mind also. Right? So you, you, that's called reciting the Dhamma. Eh? In detail, right? That means you, you also know the meaning. Same thing. Eh? You do this properly, all these five stages will arise in you. Gladness arise in you. Then because of gladness, zest arise in you. Because of zest, you have this sense of peace, tranquility, and because of the peacefulness, tranquility, you become focused, concentrated. Now we come to the number uh, four, right? That is section five. See, everything is repeated, so I, I don't have to go through with you. Ne? Section 5. Furthermore, big shoes, neither the teacher should be nor here. Ne? Neither the teacher nor a certain colleague in the holy life in the role of a teacher teaches a dharma to a monk. Nor he himself so here everything repeats. That means not, uh, none of the previous ones happening. Ne? Uh, 5.3, nor does he discuss the Dharma, in the, nor does he recite in detail. So, so this is the fourth method. Okay? The first three are not mentioned. 5.4, but he himself applies his mind to the Dharma, sustains the thought, mentally reflect on it, as he has heard it, as he has mastered it in theory. Okay, this one, the keyword that applies, you apply your mind to the Dharma. What does that mean? That means you, you heard something or you know all the words, but the meaning is very deep. So you sit quietly, and this is called the uh, solitude, eh? or what's called silent moment. Eh? You, you spend a 
part of the day sitting quietly, either meditating or studying the sutta. I have to do this quite often, you know. In fact, these few days I've been doing that because I'm writing something new, uh, a new sutta in the Sangyutta. So I have to reflect. I said, how do I write this in such a way that all the ideas flow, right? So I just let it flow in my mind. So I apply my mind to the Dharma, to the teaching. So you, you know all these teachings, then you reflect, you say, oh, what, what does the Sutta mean? You read it, it, and then you reflect on it. So from what you know, you apply it to what you don't know. That's the meaning here. You apply your mind to the Dharma. So this is another method. A simple way of saying this is you reflect on the Dharma, also can. All right? That's how wisdom grows. You, you step by step do this. Yeah? Okay? You don't need to be clever to do this. That's how you become clever, by doing this. By repetition. Now, there was a time I knew nothing about Buddhism, you know, when I was a teenager, right? So I started from there. All right? So when you do this, when you apply your mind to the Dharma, when you reflect on the Dharma, when you examine carefully what you have known, all these states will arise again. You will feel gladness. A simple sense of joy and then you just let it be this simple sense of joy grow deeper it becomes zest pity powerful joy this powerful joy be- brings powerful peace tranquility and when your mind is tranquil you focus very well you can write very clearly you can read very clearly you can talk very clearly ideas just flow joy just flow through you this is the fourth ground for freedom. Okay? Now, the last one, the sixth, uh, section six, this is the fifth ground for freedom. Okay? Section, section six, brackets five. Furthermore, big shoes. Now, everything's repeated, right? So the sutta says, okay, now none of the previous four ha- happened, okay? There is a fifth method, 6.5. But he himself properly grasps some concentration sign. Having properly considered it, having applied his mind to it, having well penetrated it with wisdom. Alright, so when he does this, all the other wonderful things, those five things will arise. This one, I think you can guess, it refers to meditation. Right? So this is the part of the sutta which describes to you what happens when you meditate. Properly grasp some concentration sign. You have been practicing, you, you have been using two of them. The first one is the breath. You use the breath for concentration. Then number two, second meditation, you use loving kindness as the sign. Okay, the word sign here, nimitta, there are at least two meanings. Eh? The first is you focus your mind on it. But then it comes and goes, right? So the sign is not very strong. When it is still, you can feel it. Then it, it is the true sign. When you do this properly, the sign brightens up, it becomes bright. You, you like see brightness in your mind. That means you are well focused. There is this brightness. The Sutta tells us, in Anguttara, the Sutta tells us that the mind by nature is bright. Very positive teaching, you know. Your mind by nature is bright. But it is clouded by impurities from outside. A simple way is, we are naturally happy. You notice children, when they play, they are, if, if they are raised in a normal way, you don't teach them all the wrong things, they naturally make friends. You can learn from how they make friends. It's amazing how they make friends. They learn to share things. They imagine things and, and they play together. You know, Very happy children. Eh? Because by nature, we are happy. 
But then once you go into the world, you have to deal with so many kinds of people, so many things. Then your mind darkens up. Your mind darkens up by what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch, what you think, what you eat also. Yeah? So the world outside flood our minds and then blur up our minds. That is why you need to meditate. When you meditate, we clear away all those extra things. We want to get back to the clear, bright mind. Okay? So when you see the bright light, that's your natural mind. The Sutta also say, or the commentaries also say that uh, at the moment of passing away, we see the bright mind again. The bright light. Okay? So and then you, if you just are happy with the bright light, then you are reborn happily also. All right. So here is called the sign, concentration sign. It just simply means the breath, loving kindness, the Buddha, whatever you, something good that you use as your meditation sign. So if you properly grasp the meditation sign, how do you properly grasp the meditation sign? You must know what it is. Okay, it's the breath. Okay, this breath comes in, goes out. Right, you, you know, not the nature of the breath. Then as you meditate, you examine the breath, say, wow, this breath is very gentle, it comes in, it moves, and then it stops a while, and there's a space, and it goes out, so you know the breath, okay? Then the Sutta says, uh, you well, well penetrated, it means you well, you understand it, and you focus on it with wisdom. Whenever you see the word with wisdom, it's very simple in this context. It means apply impermanence to it. So you notice when you do your breath meditation, sometimes I'll tell you, okay, watch your breath. You notice the breath coming in. After the breath comes in, you have to give it out. You cannot keep it. This breath is your life. But even if it is your life, you cannot hold your breath too long. You must give it back. That is impermanence. That is called you you apply your mind to the concentration sign with wisdom. You see the impermanence of it. And when you see the impermanence of it, you say, wow, this is really beautiful. You know, although it's impermanent, you cannot have it, but you are it at that time. You become that peace, and you never lose that peace when you get it. Okay? See, you can do all the chanting in the world, hundred million times if you like. Why so many times? But you do the breath meditation, you feel the peace. You can't count the peace. It remains with you forever. So what we want is the peace. Everything else leads to that peacefulness. Okay? So remember, properly grasp some concentration sign. Focus on your meditation. Examine it. What's going on here? What, how does loving kindness feel? It is also impermanent. The meditation has to end and so on. Reflect like that. Yeah? And after that, let go of all thoughts. Just feel the joy, feel the peace. That is the five stages here. All right? Gladness arises in him. Because of gladness, zest arises. Because of zest, the body becomes tranquil. When the body is tranquil, he feels happy. A happy mind becomes concentrated. Okay, so there you are. These are the five ways to be free of suffering, at least temporarily in this world for us. Ne? And you do this regularly, you will... Slow, you will gradually reach the path of awakening, you become a stream winner. All right? So what are, the four, what are the five methods again? Number one is by listening to the Dharma. Of course, it must be the Dharma, you know, not some uh, not unrelated talk to the Dharma. You know, right? That's why we prefer suttas. Okay? Number two, you, you, you yourself teach the Dharma. Because when you teach the Dharma, you have to prepare, you have to study the Dharma. You know? Right? And then you, you must teach with joy. You don't teach like you are going to win an election rally or something. No. Right? You teach with joy. You want the other person to be happy. Right? 
And number three, you recite the Dharma or you reflect the Dharma, on the Dharma. You read the Sutta, you reflect on the Sutta. And then the fifth method is meditation. Meditation. You know what you are doing. You watch the meditation sign properly. So these are called the five bases of freedom. Okay? So you have five ways. Ne? So even if you can't meditate very well, you can try one or the other four ways. Okay? Page 29. Okay? As the 3.2 brackets 5.3. Ani Varana Sutta. Now look at this word Ani Varana. A means not. Right? Not. And then Ni Varana. Hindrance. Not hindrance or without hindrance. Ani Varana Sutta. The without hindrance discourse. S46.38b. All right, so this is about the mental hindrances and the awakening factors. We choose when a um, noble disciple listens to the Dharma, giving it attention with resolve, directing his whole mind to it. He is open-eared. Okay, these are the conditions on how to listen effectively. Okay, See, Buddhism is a listening teaching. Right? So, give it attention, that means direct the mind, your mind to it. And number two is uh, your whole mind. So in other words, not one thought here and then you get lost with the thought. But everything direct, let go of other thoughts. Open ear, <laughs> it is a very interesting one. Eh? The ears are open, eh? in other words, you really listen carefully. Okay. So we're going to bring a speaker next week, so you can have more open ears. Eh? <laughs> Then, the five mental hindrances are not present in him. Okay, so when you are focused, the five hindrances are all absent. So what are the five hindrances? Okay, there you are. Section nine. These are the five mental hindrances. The mental hindrance of sensual desire. Here, desire to the senses. In other words, you are not distracted to the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. Eh? So no sensual desire, no ill will. If you don't have desire, ill will also goes away. Ill will is the opposite. Ill will basically is anger, dislike. You say, oh, this sound nice, that sound not nice, something like that. Yeah? Sloth and torpor, sleepiness is not there because you are focused. Restlessness and worry are not there. Here you are peaceful, you don't think about the past, you don't think about the future. There's no spiritual doubt, right? All these are about thinking. When we think a lot, we get doubt. Because we are focused at that time. We just listen. Just let it come, let it go. Don't think about anything. That's how you learn, okay? That's why the famous lecturers will tell you, uh, suspend all judgment. Listen carefully. At the end, you can ask questions or you can dispute, <laughs> okay? Now, so these are the five things we must get rid of when we meditate in our daily life also. Get rid of the five mental hindrances. Sense, desire, ill will, meaning like and dislike. Sloth and topper, don't be lazy. Restlessness and worry, don't worry. Last one is doubt. Okay, these are the things that prevent our mind from focusing, prevent wisdom from arising. The next set, the seventh set, is what brings wisdom to arise, brings peace of mind, brings awakening. So seven awakening factors, bojangas, satta bojanga. And what are the seven awakening factors? Satta, meaning seven bojanga awakening, awake, awakening factors that are brought to fulfillment through cultivation in him. The awakening factor of mindfulness, sati, is developed to perfection at that time. Mindfulness here means attention, you direct your mind to it, you are mindful there. You let go, push away all other things. Then number two, I'll just read the name on it, mental investigation. 
So once you reflect on the suttas, your focus, and then you mentally investigate what's going on here, what is this, right? In your meditation, you focus. You focus on the breath. Mental investigation means what? Okay, so you're not totally focused yet. So you examine and say, oh, this breath uh, is coming in, it's going out, so it's impermanent. You investigate. And then you notice there are thoughts. You say, oh, these thoughts are, this is what thoughts are, okay? So these thoughts come and go. There's nothing important. So now you know what thoughts are. This is mental investigation. Then you hear a sound. You say, okay, it's just sound. You don't say, oh, bird sound, or people outside, or whatever. Just say sound. Say, oh, this is sound. I can hear. This is sound. It's happening at my ear. Right? So you investigate like that. Right? Investigate, that means don't think. You see it for what it is. So this is the second thing, mental investigation. Right? Some teachers say this is the most important of the seven. You, you look at it correctly, and then you reflect as impermanent. You reflect what it is, it's just sound, it's impermanent, let it go like that. This is called investigation. Effort, next one is effort. All right, effort that means you keep on doing it, keep on doing it, don't give up. Meditation is all repetition, repetition. You do it again and again, then you get better. It's like doing exercise. All right, you, you see all those Tai Chi people, they do Tai Chi very nice, very graceful. Eh? So I wonder say, how they remember all the steps. I'm trying to remember just simple thing called the Surya Asana, you know, where you put your palms together, you very good for the back, you know, you do the stretch, Rana can do it. Uh, I've been watching the video again and again. You have to do it to remember. <laughs> yeah, I have to do it, exactly. <laughs> you have to do it to remember. <laughs> so, repetition. All right? So, same thing with listening to the suttas and meditation. The more you do it, the better you get, the more peaceful you become. That's called effort. Wiriya. You see, wiriya actually comes from a very interesting word. It means weir. From weir, you get the word weira, meaning hero. Okay? Then, after that, zest, joy arises. When you make the effort, zest, joy arises. That joy is mentioned again, piti. Ne? And then, when the joy comes to you in meditation, you feel really peaceful. It's very peaceful. And when there is this kind of peace, you get concentration, samadhi, okay? And then there's something new now, number seven, the word is equanimity, all right? The underlined word, eh? equanimity, upeka. Here, equanimity is, is a general term for any kind of wonderful, peaceful state, including jhanas, very deep state, okay? In fact, if you can come to number seven, it's very good already, eh? So these are the seven awakening factors. Why are they called awakening factors? They, you do this again and again, they bring you closer to the path of awakening. Eleven, big shoes, section eleven, big shoes. When the noble disciple listens to the Dhamma, giving it attention with resolve, directing his, his whole mind to it, he is open yet, then the five mental hindrances are not present in him, at that time, the seven awakening factors come to fulfillment through cultivation. All right? The only thing with us is it's temporary. So we got to make it more regular. All right? So we have the rest of our life to do it. We keep on doing it, keep on doing it. Yeah? That's one thing good about impermanence, eh? about practicing Dharma. We all grow old. And as we grow old, you go on practicing, you find, wow, you've spent so many years practicing it, you know. It's just like Sutta Translation, we started in 2001, now 18 years, 17 years have passed, just like that, you know. Right, so, you just keep on doing this good thing, you feel very happy. Right, so you go meditating, you, you will naturally feel peaceful. And it's not something you can measure, you know. People will come to you and say things like, you know, you've I feel very peaceful when I come near you, you know. Or I look at you, I feel very peaceful. Okay, those are wonderful remarks. It means you'll be meditating well. You know? uh, and you find that people don't cause you problems. Or even there are problems, you find, oh, it's okay, let it come, let it go. So those are signs you have done your meditation well. Uh -huh. So remember, get rid of five hindrances. 
cultivate the seven awakening factors. If you cannot remember what the seven are, just remember the first two. Mindfulness and mental investigation. Okay? So, there you are. We have we conclude the teaching for today. No? Any questions? So, I hope all these are clear enough. No? Okay, so let us close with a short reflection. Yeah, per perseverance is another word for effort. Same. Effort, so, yeah, same, effort. yeah. Same, it's the same thing. Yeah. Is free. Mm. You have to put effort on it. The, to, to keep it simple, it's the habit we have. Ah, I mean, you know, whatever you do, you must have one good habit. Learn to be happy inside. Yeah. Very important. Inside. Okay, so one good way to do this is when you're falling asleep, you must smile. Yeah. Ah, you, when you fall asleep, you better smile, you know. I don't know, Singapore and I, we have this meditation group to say, I can't smile. I say, smile in your heart. <laughs> smile in your heart. I say, I can't. I say, I say wow. I cannot. Practice. Go back. Practice. And this is for your health, you know. Not just Buddhism. Eh? It's your health also. Okay? Of course, for Buddhism, it's also important. So when you're lying asleep, you just smile. And then, of course, to help it, you say something meaningful. Eh? Uh, your favorite loving kindness words. Eh? Uh, may my family be well and happy. May my cats be well and happy. May my friend uh, who is sick be well and happy. Only happy thoughts. Lah. Just go on saying. Don't plan. You know? Very important. Don't plan. Eh? Don't think. You know? Feeling. You just say it, then you'll fall asleep. That's the idea. Feeling. Not thinking. Eh? Loving kindness is feeling. So smiling also feeling. Just do that. Then you find your dreams are so happy. Alright? <laughs> huh? You do that? Do you? I agree. Very good. And then when you wake up middle of the night, same thing. Eh? Sometimes you wake up middle of the night so dark and alone. So, oh, what's happening eh, in the world? And then same thing. You find all those thoughts will come. You know? But you are in charge. You say, no, okay, may I be well and happy? May I be at peace with myself? Smile. Because when you smile, all the darkness doesn't matter already. <laughs> Otherwise, fear will arise. You know, so especially even children, it's important to teach to children. You know, if you teach children early, you say, Hey, you go to bed, smile, okay? When you're foreigner, say, Smile. Then, wow, they are very lucky after they grow up, they learn all these things. And then, then, no negative thoughts. Oh, they learn a lot of negative things from adults. Children, by nature, you know, they, they are kind to each other, they're friendly, you know, they learn a lot of bad things from others. So, be very careful what we teach them. When you're doing the smiling, you're, when you go to sleep, it's just smiling. No, no reason, no? just smiling. Okay? Because when you smile, those uh, endorphins and what's the other one? Dopamine. Dopamine. Now they know, you know, all these happy juices uh, flow. And this helps you to be happy, you know. Now I'm telling you seriously because I got young people in Singapore getting cancer. Very strange. So don't be stressful. So this is how you learn to be happy. Nah? You don't know Sutta, so never mind, but smile when you go to sleep. Okay? Then you'll be happy, make other people happy, then you live well, then you can study Sutta well also. Mm -hmm. Alright, so we end tonight and eh? we close with a short reflection. Okay? <clears throat> Alright, so right, today we have studied uh, Vimutta Yatana Sutta and also about the Awakening factors. All these teachings remind us that any time we we can get wisdom, important thing is to just keep our minds open, peaceful, and ready. Right. So and ready to learn, ready to reflect, and learn to be at peace at our but within ourselves. All the answers. All the goodness comes from within ourselves. Reflecting in this way is, is very good karma. But the power of such karma, but the power of the three jewels, may we be well and happy. May we be blessed with wisdom and courage to at least aspire to stream winning in this life itself. And also by the power of the three jewels, may our family and loved ones be well and happy. May they to see the true teachings and be happy in this life itself. May all those who are practicing 
the Dharma to see the fruits of the Buddha's teaching in this life itself. May those who are lost or have difficulties to find their way quickly back to the Buddha's teaching. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.